Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this uh, presentation on Tax Act and Compensation and Claims. Thank you for uh, being here today. My name is Jennifer Rutquist, and I'm a CalTAP training coordinator with the California Department of Veterans Affairs. I'm really excited about being here. I'm excited that you guys are all here because I know this is really great information. I know it's going to make a huge impact for you guys. We have some really great presenters here to really give you some great resources and support. Um, with these subjects. We have to get uh, today here, Lauren uh, Wagner. She is Skyline's VRC program um, service coordinator. We also have Bridget. Bridget from um, SV, SFVA Student Veterans Health Program also. Um, Brian is hosting right here. Brian Margus is um, the uh, VRC here. Thank you, Brian. Um, we also have, and he's been doing all of our technology. Thank you, Brian, for doing our technology. Um, we also have Maurice. Maurice is here from San Francisco County Veterans Service Office. And we're so lucky today because usually we only have one County Veterans Service Office. But we were lucky enough to have two. Also, Ed is here from San Mateo College. So this is also being um, broadcasted at Skyline College also. So Skyline is in the San Mateo area. So we're lucky enough to have both of these County Veterans Service Offices to make that connection uh, for all of you. Um, so. With that being said, I'm going to hand the floor over to Lauren now, and she's going to tell you more about um, services there. Thank you, Jennifer, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Lauren Wagner, and I'm the program coordinator of the Veterans Resource Center at Skyline College. So Skyline Co College is part of the San Mateo County Community College District. So alongside my college, my sister colleges, College of San Mateo and Kenyatta College. So each college has a veteran center and a coordinator, um, and we work together to help connect students, faculty, and staff with resources and services for veterans and military-connected individuals. Um, I'm really excited about our event today. Um, as Jennifer was saying, we are facilitating a cross district, uh, cross county collaboration. Um, so we have CalVet, CalTAP, City College um, hosting in person. We've got San Francisco VA, our um, Veteran Service County office. Um, our link agency representative is there today. Uh, I want to briefly recognize my City College collaborator, Brian Vargas, who's in person today supporting this event. Um, as Brian's service background closely aligns with the information we'll be presenting today, I wanted to share a brief bio about him. So Brian is a Marine Corps, a Marine Corps veteran who was deployed in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. While on a three-day mission, Brian was shot in the face and hand by a sniper, causing long-term chronic injuries. He was medically evacuated and spent 30 days receiving treatment at Walter Reed Hospital and was medically retired from the Marine Corps with a Purple Heart on August 30th, 2009. Since that time, Brian attended UC Berkeley where he obtained both his bachelor's degree and his master's degree in social work and is now the manager of the Veterans Resource Center at City College. Additionally, I'm delighted to introduce my San Francisco VA collaborator, Brian Le or, sorry, Bridget Leach, who's here today as well, and she's gonna provide a brief overview of VA healthcare. Thank you, Lauren, so much. Um, and so I'm Bridget. I'm a licensed clinical social worker with the San Francisco VA Student Veteran Health Program. And um, if you guys could go to the next slide, that would be awesome, if you don't mind, Jennifer. Great. So this is a, a bit of our intro slide um, for, Jen, um, excuse me, for Lauren's um, intro and introducing also Brian. Thank you for introducing Brian and thank you so much for doing all the technology and hosting, um, co-hosting today and um, myself. And you can go to the next slide if you don't mind. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so um, I actually work with our San Francisco VA Student Veteran Health Program, which is one of a number of national vital sites across the country. Um, our Student Veteran Health Program and our national vital sites provide services to student veterans locally and across the country, including assistance with enrolling in and navigating VA healthcare, connecting veterans with college, community, and VA programs and services. And um, we are really lucky to be here at City College of San Francisco, where we've been since 2010. Um, so we work very closely with Brian and his team, and we're super um, happy to be able to be in here and be of support. Um, I've been the coordinator of our San Francisco VA Student Veteran Health Program since 2010 as well. Um, and if you don't mind going to the next slide, please. 
Um, here's an example of some of our um, outreach at event advertising posters. So if you ever see these at City College or at Skyline or at other schools that we support, um, please take notice and notice when we're having our outreach events. And we all can also schedule times outside of the events as well. Um, our San Francisco VA Student Health Program actually has team members in various schools throughout Northern California. Um, I'm proud to be the SVHP coordinator assigned to Skyline, City College of San Francisco, and Golden Gate University. Um, next slide, please. Um, we've learned that it can be really helpful, particularly when we're talking about service connection disability benefits and how they work together with the VA to have a bit of a bird's eye view and a general orientation to the three branches of the Department of Veterans Affairs and how they work together, particularly with our county veteran service offices, um, particularly, again, as we're looking at the service connected disability claims process, as well as treatment and care for service connected disabilities. Um, so when we're kind of looking at this particular slide, right, um, the way that I tend to think about the Veterans Health Administration of the VA or the VHA um, is that it involves medical and or mental health treatment and care um, for veterans, both service-connected and non-service-connected conditions, as well as preventive care. And then the way that I think about the Veterans Benefits Administration branch of the VA or the VBA is that it involves some kind of monetary benefit. So we're thinking thinking about service connection disability payments, GI Bill payments, or VRNE, Voc Rehab, Chapter 31 um, payments or benefits. Um, I find that a lot of folks tend to interchange the VHA and the VBA. And for example, they may think that they have um, VA health care and that they're already enrolled if they have a service connection disability rating, but oftentimes they could have one and not the other. So it's always good to make sure that you're um, getting connected with both um, branches of the VA. Um, now, while the CVSO, which you can, can see on this slide, is not technically a branch of the VA, um, we work really closely, and actually the CVSOs work very closely with all three branches of the VA. Um, and we often refer to each other. So us at the the um, San Francisco VA or the Veterans Health Administration refer to our local county veteran service offices um, quite often and they to us as well. Um, they're a pretty natural pairing, especially now with the PACT Act expanding both the um, a VA healthcare as well as VA disability benefits to veterans with toxic exposures from burn pits and other in-service environmental toxins. Um, next slide, please. Thank you so much. Um, for those interested in enrolling in the VA healthcare system um, with the Veterans Health Administration branch of the VA, we're happy to help you with that process as part of our student veteran health program. Um, we're available in person after this presentation at City College today. And we can also schedule other times to meet with folks um, and speak um, either at City College, Skyline, or one of our other sites or future events. Um, so please see the information on this slide um, for other ways to connect um, with us as well. Um, we also have Michelle Boswego, our health benefits advisor from the San Francisco VA Member Services Department here at CCSF today, who is able to register veterans in the Toxic Risk Exposure Risk Assessment um, or Terra database, which is a very nice service to be able to have offering here today. Um, at this time, Michelle is able to register veterans in the Terra database based on self-report. Um, and I think this is my contact information. So now kind of transitioning to Ed and Maurice from the County Veteran Service Office. Um, I was just going to say, you know, Lauren, Ryan, and we are all very passionate, so sorry, about our shared mission across um, Skyline, CCSF, and the San Francisco VA Student Veteran Health Program and supporting student veterans in higher education. We highly value our collaboration with CalVet and CalTAP and putting to on a series of webinars of topics of interest. And we are very appreciative to our colleagues including Maurice and Ed from the County Veterans Service Office in San Francisco and San Mateo counties, respectively, whose presentation we are also looking forward to today. Thank you so much. Hi, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here um, with uh, Ed. I'm with Maurice Delmore with the San Francisco County Veterans Service Office. Ed Kirkson, uh, San Francisco County Veterans Service Office, uh, just to... Uh, same thing, different counties. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, um, good. Uh, 
All right, so let me just start with the basics. And I'm not going to go directly off this. I'm just going to kind of share with you what I found to be effective in terms of talking to the veterans. So for those of you that aren't aware of what veteran services offices are, in the state of California, each county is required to appoint a veteran services officer. Uh, and then the county has the discretion of actually being able to also start up an office or have additional staff to help veterans. So both, we're very fortunate, San Francisco County, San Francisco County, both counties have seen fit to help uh, fund veteran services offices. We're not only you have business officers, but you have veteran services representatives that can help veterans. Um, biggest thing, distinction I want to make about veteran service officers, mm -hmm. um, we're county employees, most, first and foremost. Uh, we are accredited to the VA, but we work for the county of San Mateo. Why I think that's important? Well, that makes us advocates for the vet. It makes us, we're required to be experts in VA law. We assist veterans uh, in navigating the different programs that are available to veterans. We actually can represent a veteran as a POA uh, in, pursuit of, in the pursuit of their claims. Um, we tend to have a really good understanding of all the different services and are well connected with all the partners that help veterans. But most importantly, we're the advocate for the veteran. And, and why that's important is because I have veterans that are getting out of service that are coming to my office. I have veterans that have been out of service for decades that walk in my office. I have veterans that have pursued claims before through different organizations or on their own who've not had a lot of success to come into my office. Our job is to help veterans get access to the benefit that they're entitled to. Um, examples of the different programs that we can help you with. Probably the easily the, the most common program that we that we help veterans with is disability claims. Um, we also do a lot of VA pension claims and we could talk a little bit more later if you want about what the pension process looks like. Uh, individual unemployability, in a nutshell, a program that if you are disabled and that disability prevents you from gainful and sustained employment, you're able to get additional benefits of the VA. Again, we help veterans in that process, apply for that program. Um, VA burial benefits, which are, you know, actually really surprisingly big. And and and, and when you learn more about them, it's actually a, a great, how do I put this, tough subject to talk about, but family members can be very grateful sometimes when they find out what's available since this program. Uh, VA healthcare enrollment, which is, I can't stress to you enough how important that is. We're gonna talk a little bit more about what that looks like. But if you're a veteran, you have you are, you have access to some of the finest healthcare in the United States, particularly if you look around here where we've got VA San Francisco and VA Palo Alto, supported by Stanford, UCSF. I mean, you, you have access to some of the best healthcare and doctors here, and it's free for the most part. Um, veterans Benefits, uh, readiness and employment program. So it, it is an excellent program. A lot of people take advantage of if you are disabled or your disabilities prevent you from pursuing the line of work that you're trying to do, you can get retrained to do a whole other line of work. Um, the work study program and VA life insurance, home loan guarantees, et cetera, all well worth exploring. And again, if you have any questions, just call your BSL. All right, so again, I talked about disability, probably the biggest program, most common program that um, that, that, that we work with veterans on. Um, how many folks here are familiar with VA disability compensation? Awesome. I like this, I like, when I talk to somebody for the first time, I'll tell them this, it's like workers' comp in the military, all right? Um, when you're going through maps and you, before you can even sign, you know, swear in, you gotta go through the full physical, right? So if you've got a bad knee, they're not gonna let you in. If you have bad you know, feet, you're not gonna let they're not gonna let you in. Essentially, once you get sworn in, it's suggesting that you're whole of mind and body at that point, right? Now, if you leave service and you're not in that exact same condition, very likely that the VA is responsible for helping you out because they're probably responsible for that change in condition. So if you jump out of planes all the time. If you are around very loud noises all the time, your hearing's bad, your knees are bad, your back's bad, or you've been deployed and you've had some pretty tough experiences that you've been through and you're having a difficult time adjusting now that you're back, VA is responsible to help you in a number of different ways, not only just getting access to treatment, but also compensation for the disability that you've incurred. That's what we help veterans with. Probably the most complicated of all the programs and probably the most sought after program the VA offers, okay? So there's three things to a VA compensation plan. You have a current diagnosed disability, all right? 
something occurred in service that either caused, contributed, or exacerbated that condition. And three, we can make a link between one and two. That's what we call the nexus statement, right? So a fully developed claim is going to be able to represent all three of those. We're going to have the diagnosis. We're going to talk about the incident, incidents, et cetera, exposures that cause this. And then we're also going to provide the evidence as required, depending on the type of claim you had, to connect those three. You get those three, you get service connected. All right. Any quick questions about that? So now I talked about three and I said the type of nexus that's required. There's really two types of nexuses, right? Um, the first, probably most common, or used to be maybe, hopefully won't be in the future, is what's called an evidence-based claim. Meaning that we provide evidence to show the linkage between your current disability and the incident that occurred in service, right? Really easy if you if you jumped out of a plane and you, and you, and you tore your knee up when you landed and you were treated, we're gonna be able to go into your service treatment record, we're gonna be able to identify the incident, we're gonna be able to identify the treatment, and then your current diagnosis is really gonna link the, the two, right? But in a lot of cases, you've got situations where maybe something wasn't reported. Um, for those of you that might have been in during my time, um, and probably still the same, if you're in the military, it, it's not necessary. It, you're not encouraged to complain about everything. You're not encouraged to report everything. You're kind of encouraged to roast and burn it and just keep going, right? So a lot of times, some of that direct evidence may not be there. That's our job. Our job is to help put together and develop this claim using everything that's our, at our disposal, which includes years of experience doing this. Okay. So that's an evidence-based claim. Now, what the other type of, of nexus that can occur is what's called a presumptive condition. And what a presumptive means is that the VA has conceded through a preponderance of evidence and lawsuits likely that there's a strong likelihood of connection between a type of disease or an illness, et cetera, and something that occurred in service, right? So first one that always jumps to my mind is Agent Orange. So if a veteran during the Vietnam War set foot on Vietnam soil or was in 12 nautical miles of the coastal waterways, the VA has assumed at this point that you were exposed to Agent Orange. So what does Agent Orange do? Well, the VA has identified several diseases and cancers that are associated with exposure to Agent Orange. So veteran comes in and says, I have type two diabetes, okay? Which is one of the presumptive conditions for Agent Orange. Okay, so tell us about your service. Where did you serve? Well, I was, at a Thai air base supporting the Vietnam War. Okay, it's in service records. Well, through changes like the PACT Act, the VA is conceived that if you serve in a Thailand air base, or you served in Vietnam, or you served on the North Korean DMZ, or on Guam, or any number of different places, during certain periods of time, they're conceding that you were likely exposed to Agent Orange. There's our nexus. So presumptive conditions are really important, especially now with the implementation of the Blue Water Navy Act, the PACT Act in particular. Why the PACT Act is important? Because probably most of you didn't serve in Nam, I'm guessing, but you, some of you may have served in Southwest Asia, right? Gulf War, Operation Iraqi Freedom, Operation Enduring Freedom. The VA has, so again, to a preponderance of evidence and probably lawsuits again, identified certain toxins that you were exposed to while you were there, okay? And they have identified a list of diseases and illnesses that are associated with your exposure there, okay? So again, if you develop any of these diseases and exposures, or any diseases or, or cancers, and you serve in that region during that period of time, you are presumptively connected, okay? So again, as VSOs, our job is to educate you on this when you come into our office and then to sit down, file your claim. Actually, what we're first gonna do is file an intent to file, to capture the date and give us a year to develop this claim if we need to. And we're gonna develop this claim and because of our experience, we're gonna develop this claim to get this claim right. And unfortunately, the VA doesn't always get it right. That's okay, because we spend a lot of our time showing the VA what they did wrong and getting it right for you. So we also do a lot of appeals. Our job, we're county employees. We represent you. We're taking care of the people who live in our county. We're gonna fight the VA if we need to to make sure you're getting what you're entitled to. All right, so 
Let me know where All right, we're, we're, we're tag teaming this. Um, so we're kind of, kind of going to jump into uh, presumptive conditions a little further uh, to kind of set things up for the about the PACT Act specifically. Uh, so presumptive conditions, you know, uh, Ed talked about Agent Orange. Um, there's a kind of a predecessor to the PACT Act specific to veterans who served in, in the Middle East, in the Gulf, in, in Southwest Asia. And uh, these are undiagnosed illnesses and what are called muckmies. Muckmie is a medically unexplained chronic multi-symptomatic illness. Uh, so if a veteran served in uh, after August 2nd, 1990 in the following countries, I'm not going to read them, uh, they're up on the slide, uh, but if a veteran served in one of those locations and has an undiagnosed illness or has a medically unexplained chronic multi-symptomatic illness, those, that's your nexus right there, okay, as, as, as Ed mentioned. You don't need, um, you don't need to get a medical opinion uh, to connect those two things. It's simply presumed based on law and regulation. So uh, a little bit about undiagnosed illnesses. They're really hard to service connect because uh, the VA puts out a list of symptoms, not a comprehensive one, that if the veteran has a symptom that is unexplained, they can and they serve in the location, um, in one of those locations after August 2nd, 1990, they are presumed, it is presumed to be uh, service connected, right? And then the severity of the symptom will depend on uh, or the symptoms will depend on the rating that they are uh, granted. However, doctors like to uh, diagnose it, right? So undiagnosed illnesses are difficult to service connect because most times that symptom might be related to something else or a doctor thinks it's related to something else. So medically unexplained chronic multi-symptomatic illnesses are diagnosed conditions of conditions that are kind of unexplained, right? Where did this come from? What's the etiology of it? meaning where did, what's the origin of it and what's the pathophysiology, uh, what are the symptoms associated. So uh, just, just the bottom line of undiagnosed illnesses and multi-symptomatic, uh, medically unexplained chronic multi-symptom illnesses is if you have something, you don't know where it's from, you don't know what it is, why it's bothering you, go get it checked out and that might lead to a, a presumptive claim, all right? And, all right, cool. So, that kind of sets up the PACT Act, which is the Sergeant Heath Robinson honoring our promise to address comprehensive toxins of 2022 Act, uh, public law number 117-168, if you're into that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hey, there's some nerds, some nerds out. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a policy nerd. For sure. um, the president signed the PACT Act into law August 10th, 2022, which is the effective date, which we'll get into a little bit later, for any claims for PACT Act related conditions filed by August 14th, 2023. So what is the PACT Act? What did it do? One thing it did is, does is it expands VA healthcare to millions of veterans. And starting on March 5th of this year, so now about a week ago, uh, VA healthcare enrollment expanded for those veterans who qualify under PACT Act. Uh, it also expands, as, uh, as Ed mentioned, expands Agent Orange conceded exposure areas. So, and we'll get into that a little bit later as well. Um, it adds conditions to the Agent Orange presumptive list. It establishes presumptive conditions due to burn pit exposure. So this is for your, uh, your Southwest Asia deployed veterans, right? Uh, if you were exposed to airborne hazards and burn pits, um, it expands, it establishes presumptive conditions related to those. And it eliminates requirements regarding the date and severity of the manifestation. So what does that mean? Previously, before the PACT Act, those undiagnosed illnesses, those um, muckmies, they had to manifest themselves to a, a compensable level before and within a year or within a certain period of time after service to be service connected, all right? PACT Act did away with that. So now qualifying conditions can manifest to any degree at any time after service. Uh, it also, and we'll talk we'll get into some of these other areas, but it expands radiation locations and conditions for veterans who, you know, did cleanups of, um, of well, we'll get into that. Provides the secretary of the VA the ability to add or remove conditions from the presumptive list as the medical evidence suggests and allows for veterans, um, allows for veterans who lived or worked at Camp Lejeune and anybody, any civilian, uh, a spouse or a civilian work employee who worked at Camp Lejeune to sue the federal government, which again, we'll get into that in a little bit. 
So uh, back to Agent Orange, uh, the qualifying locations, as I mentioned, any Thai Air Force Base, um, Laos. So these are these are the locations where the VA has presumed that if you serve in those locations based on your, your service records, ED-214, uh, official military personnel files, uh, service treatment records, if you serve in that location, the VA has conceded that, in fact, you were exposed to Agent Orange, okay? It also added two new qualifying conditions, high blood pressure, hypertension, which was, which was not previously on that list of presumptive conditions, and something called monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, or MGUS. Don't know what that is, but apparently it has to do with your blood. Um, so now getting into veterans who probably more served in, in our generation, right? The generation I served in. Presumptive service connection for burn pit and airborne hazard exposure. So again, you're, you're deployed veterans who serve in Southwest Asia area of operations, uh, including after, so this is after September 11, 2001, the PACT Act expands on these locations. Afghanistan, Djibouti, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Uzbekistan, and Yemen, and the airspace above any of those locations. And it added the uh, list of cancers uh, and a list of other illnesses that are presumptive to the serve to your service in that in those areas. So again, if you serve from August 2nd, 1990 in, in the Southwest Asia area of operations, you you might have an undiagnosed illness, you might have a, a muck meat. Or you might have any of these conditions, right? Which the PACT Act expanded or established. And if you serve after September 11, 2001 in any of these new locations, and you have any of these conditions or any of the previous conditions, you are, it is presumptive to your service in those locations. So the PACT Act, as I mentioned, also expands on, on healthcare benefits. Uh, it extends eligibility for VA health care for veterans of toxic exposures and veterans of the Vietnam, Gulf War, and post-9-11 eras. Uh, it increases the eligibility uh, benefits without first applying for VA benefits. So you don't need to have that service-connected disability now to apply for VA health care. You can apply based on those, those categories. Um, and then all transitioning service members are now entitled to VA health care for 10 years post-service, which is which is great, right? I mean, you don't have to have that, again, that service connected disability piece does not need to be there. You can just enroll in, in, in excellent healthcare. It requires all veterans in the VA medical system to participate in a toxic exposure exam, regardless of the era served. Toxic exposure exams, these are not compensation and pension exams. These are not going to your medical provider to get, a, you know, to get treatment. These are specific exams to determine if you served in a specific area, whether you might have any symptoms associated with those, uh, those, those uh, presumptive conditions, right? So it's a, it's a questionnaire that you complete through the, usually through the environmental health uh, clinic or program at, at your local VA facility, usually a VA medical center. And then they, you get follow, they follow up with you to do an assessment. And based on that, those results are then transferred to your, supposed to be transferred to your provider for further uh, exploration and treatment uh, and discussion. And then, as I mentioned, uh, also, and then it also requires the VA and DOD to establish an exposure tracking record system to track any exposure a veteran may have had during service, meaning if you have anything that is in your service treatment records, it's supposed to go into this uh, tracking system, which uh, Bridget mentioned a little bit earlier. And then beginning on March 5th, as I mentioned, 2024, uh, you can start enrolling, the VA will start enrolling veterans who are either serving in the Vietnam, uh, Vietnam, Gulf War, Iraq, including Iraq, Afghanistan, or any other combat zone after 9-11, or deployed in support of the global war on terror, or was exposed to toxins or other hazards during their military service. So that's pretty expansive. And additional regulations, uh, as I mentioned, I was going to cover uh, under the PACT Act, um, presumed exposure to radiation. So that just expands if you're involved in the cleanup of an Enawatik Atoll, I'm probably mispronouncing that, the cleanup of an Air Force B-52 bomber carrying nuclear weapons near Pal Palomares, Spain, and the response to a fire on board an Air Force B-52 bomber, et cetera. So it expands presumption to those veterans. Um, many of us probably wouldn't qualify. And then there are some other, uh, they, 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 you know, again, these, these 
this regulation, this law, allows the VA in Congress to add things over time. So different locations might be added over time. Different presumptive conditions might be added over time. And also um, the Camp Lejeune Justice Act uh, includes a section allowing veterans and families exposed to contaminated water at Camp Lejeune to file a federal tort claim. This is not a disability claim. This goes through a law firm. You have to go through a law firm. It's a tort claim, meaning you're suing the federal government. So that's not something that we as county veteran service offices or any veteran service organization would get involved with. That's something you would uh, discuss um, with, a, with, a, with a law firm, with a, with a legal entity. So uh, liberalizing law change, this is important um, because this this changes depending on the act that, that occurs. And, and what this means, is if you so we used to have people come into our office with Bernadis or Science Act to serve in, 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 in the Middle East, still serve in Iraq, et cetera. Part of the PACT Act, they, they had to provide evidence. And as Maurice had mentioned, certain um, symptoms had to manifest themselves to a certain degree within a certain period of time. Otherwise, we're kind of out of luck, right? So what that meant was that people came in our office, filed plans or filed file claims on their own, were denied. Um, when acts like the PACT Act get implemented, they can affect previous claims in different ways. So liberalizing law is one of the laws that can affect that. So if there's a change in law or be a regulation that allows us to pay disability compensation monthly payments, the effective date may be assigned in any of these ways. If we get your claim within one year of law or regulation changing, the effective date may be the date the law or regulation changed. So the PACT Act was implemented last August, correct? August 22. August 22, 20, I'm sorry, 22. So if you would have filed an intent between August 22 and August 2023, you would have been able to get a back date back to August 2022. Once that year passed, you can file a date, you can file a claim now and it'll go back, but it's a rolling date. So that's what that means. Um, so once there's a change, you have up to a year typically to be able to file that claim and still get that effect, the original effective date of the implementation of that law. If we review a claim or you request a review more than one year after the law or regulation change, the effective date may be up to one year before the date we got your request or the date we decided to pay benefits on your claim. So that's now. So we've gone past August 2023, that law takes, or that, that part of the law takes effect. The effective date of PACT Act claim or intent to file is within a year of the liberalizing law received an effective date of the date of the bill, which was signed August 10th, 2022. Claims received more than a year after the PACT Act was signed in the law may receive retroactive pay up to a year from the date the VA received the claim or ITF. Okay, ITF is intent to file. Is everybody here familiar with an intent to file? Okay, basically, if you have any thought whatsoever of filing a claim or pursuing a claim, First thing you should do is file an intent to file. It gives you up to a year and it protects that particular date. And why this is important is because if you filed it today, then and you get service connected in six, seven, eight months, now it won't just pay you back to today, it will pay you back a year from today. Okay. So the, now let's talk about the PACS Act, uh, VA duty assist and compensation and pension exams. So the duty to assist, the VA is required to, within certain extents, assist you in the development of your claim. So the PACT Act requires the VA to provide a competent pension exam to any veteran where the veteran participated in a toxic exposure risk activity and there's evidence of a disability, unless such evidence is not sufficient to establish a service connection for disability. A medical opinion may be requested as to whether it is at least as likely as not there's a nexus between the claim that conditions and the toxic exposure risk, uh, risk activity. And the intent was to make it easier for veterans to obtain exams under this theory. Okay. Bottom line is, if you've been in any of these areas, or you suspect that you may have been exposed to any toxins, now keep in mind it's not just the PACT Act, Southwest Asia, Asian Orange. Um, there's toxins domestically. There is asbestos in barracks. You, some of you had MOSs that exposed you to toxins carcinogens, et cetera. Your best bet is to go in and do a toxic screening, even if you're not experiencing any particular symptoms right now. Reason being, there may be markers, or at the very least, you would have it on your record that, hey, yes, this person was exposed. Maybe something hasn't manifested itself yet, but there's a risk now because of the potential exposure. And now you're in the VA system. 
And if you are developing symptoms and there is a nexus, now the nexus for the VA is 50-50, it's as likely as not. So if it's as likely as not that the symptom you're dealing with is a result of your exposure, you could be entitled to disability and compensation. Uh, VA exams, and, and just real quick, and the, the duty to assist means that the VA has to, should, is supposed to provide you with an examination, independent examination, which if you're filing a claim, is not always the case. That you, if the VA can't make that determination between that link between your service and the, and the condition that you're claiming, they may not be able to, or are you missing information? You're missing that evidence from the from your service treatment records that the condition started in the service, or you don't have a current diagnosis. The VA may not provide you that compensation and pension examination. So this liberalizes things. So the VA examination and the nexus. So if you get a VA exam to address the nexus benefits, then the examiner cannot provide a negative opinion only because the condition is not included on the presumptive list. Okay. Must address the total exposure to all applicable military deployments of the veteran and the synergistic combined effect of all toxin, toxic exposures, risk activities to the veteran. Now, the VA has compiled and has continued to compile a very comprehensive list of all the potential toxic exposures throughout the entire military. That includes all the bases, ships, and deployment areas. Okay. Um, and as Maurice mentioned earlier, they're they have the, the the right to continue to add diseases to these presumptive lists, right? So the more information they get, the more of a connection they start to make, it's very likely they could add additional diseases. Again, why I think it's important, regardless of whether you're this, you have symptoms of, of something that are all presumptive, you should go get a toxic exposure screen from the VA. Okay, because who knows that if the, the, the issue you're dealing with today might not be considered a presumptive issue down the road here. Okay, and it cannot require a, a higher burden of proof than benefit of the doubt, i.e. 50-50, as I likely as not. Yeah, and that, that also means that if you have a medical opinion from one uh, provider, from your private provider, and a medical opinion, another medical opinion from a compensation and pension examiner, the VA has to, again, Equipose has to uh, rule in the veteran's favor. So that's, that's what that means. Yeah. Don't the toxic exposure you're on, like high radiation was part of a classified system and it probably isn't like readily available to the VA. Is that something that they can search well, themselves? They're, they're, to your point, um, sometimes the information might not re be readily available on certain records, right? Doesn't mean that the issue has not been content in contention before. It doesn't mean that there isn't already be a law that sets precedent for it. So there's a lot of different ways to, to, to look at that. For example, um, when they when they implemented the um, uh, Blue Water Navy Act, they didn't have a complete list of all the ships that were within 12, that were within 12 nautical miles at any point of the uh, water uh, the coast of Vietnam. So what would what, what was happening is folks would come up. They say we don't have a record on ship log. They would provide evidence themselves, and that evidence then would be taken into consideration. And to Maurice's point, it's if I have a piece of evidence. And you as a VA don't have anything to say that it's not an accurate piece of evidence. You have to take it as positive evidence in my favor. So a lot of times things are developed that way also. In that case, it's important to just sit down with the VSR and actually look at the specific claim and, do, and look at the development components of it case by case. Yeah, is that really interesting? You never know what's after this. And we can talk to you at, offline. So it wouldn't be the first. <laughs> that way. So lastly, uh, this is... These are our locations, uh, San Mateo County and San Francisco County. We both have outstations. Uh, San Mateo County has an outstation at the San Bruno. Yeah, San Bruno VA Clinic every uh, Tuesday. Uh, one of my BSRs is out there. You can always go see them. Um, our phone number here, you go ahead and give us a call. We can always tell you where we're out posting at or schedule an appointment to come see us. We also do virtual appointments too, to make it easier. Same here. Uh, our outstation is on Wednesdays at the San Francisco VA Medical Center. And uh, the best way to uh, make an appointment, uh, whether it's virtual or in person, uh, default is a virtual appointment, is by going to our website there. Um, you can also email us uh, or call us, and uh, we'll assist you that way. Can I add one more thing, too? For those of you that have moved around a lot, um, if you go to a county VSO, we're all accredited to the California Department of Veterans Affairs. So we're all under the same accreditation. So if, I, if, if, if we have a POA, power of attorney, um, through CalVet, Somebody goes from Maurice's office to San Diego, that VSO is going to pick up the case right there. That's one of the actual big benefits of working with the county veteran services office because you're actually part now of a very statewide network. 
uh, an organization that basically works together. Okay, that's awesome. So we're gonna hold off on questions until we end up all the presentation. Thank you so much, you guys. Um, we are so lucky to have you guys. Um, what a wealth of information. Um, and you guys are very thorough. I, I learned quite a bit actually, so thank you so much. Um, all right, let's move on. So, yeah, let's do my class. I'm actually gonna take their numbers down myself and I'm probably gonna refer some people to them. That's, no, we're fine. Yeah, we're already this far, we're good. <laughs> um, so yes, my um, I'm coming back in now and tell you more about who I am. I am Jennifer Redquist. I'm a Calcutta training coordinator. I'm also a veteran myself. Um, I was a military brat growing up. My dad served from um, when I was born until 94, I think. Um, my husband just retired from the Air Force 26 years, and I actually have kids your age. I know I don't look very well right now, I hope you're class. Um, but my son uh, is in Las Vegas serving in the Air Force. My daughter is in Utah, Washington, serving in the Air Force. And I have another son in Montana serving in the Air Force. I say all this because I want you to know that the information and the people that are here today are incredible. And they really do care. And they're very passionate about what they do. And I was out in the military for 20 years before I filed a claim or went to a VA facility, do not do that. The information I'm giving you is the information I give my daughter, my sister, my mom, my dad, my brother, my son. And that's the same, I'm sure the same thing with all the other presenters. They're just as passionate. So please take their advice, go in, go into a county, but even if you don't, if you don't think that you're gonna file a claim, go in a county veteran service office just to find out what those benefits are. So just a little bit about who CalVet is. You have big VA at the top, right? Um, they go over, you know, all veterans who've served in the United States military, right? But it's hard for them to reach down in each single state. So the next thing you have is the, the State Department, which is us, CalVet, right? And from there you have the county offices because the state of California is pretty, pretty big. Um, and so in order to get to each section of people and populations, we have these county offices that are so incredible that they have knowledge about federal benefits, state benefits, and even those local different resources that can help you get to benefits and support that you might need, whether it's community support or peer support also. So anything that you might need, they're, they're our go-to guys. They definitely um, are a powerful tool that you can keep share with anyone and everyone. Um, they're really important. And then we have the service providers down here also, American Legion, DAV, Swords and Postures, um, is also a fantastic organization. So with all these different entities, it's important to know that none of us work for each other, we work with each other. So we're going to refer each other out like, oh, we're not expertise here, but this is the expertise here. Or, you know, you can't get a hold of the VA, so maybe you're gonna call the CalVet. CalVet's gonna say, okay, you know, we can help you with this, but county office can help you with this. So we're gonna help you get to the the people that you need in your benefits. We're going to make it accessible to you. So what is CalTAP? I've said it a few times. CalTAP stands for the California Transitions Assistance Program. It was designed to inform and connect veterans of all eras to their earned federal and state benefits as you need to change over time. I said that verbatim because I want you to know that I understand your needs change over time. The things that you need right now while you're going to school are not the same things you're going to need when you're trying to look for a job. They're not going to be the same when you have a child. They're not going to be the same when you buy a house. So you're gonna, things are going to change and you, I want you to know that we're here for you and we want to, you, we want you to have access to this information 24 seven. And you can do this on our website. Um, we have a, a, a portal and we're just gonna, this is a snapshot of what we mean by, we want to be there cradle to grave. We want to be there for you nonstop. And we want to be for you, there for you before you even join, before you even talk to a, a recruiter who want to be like, hey, these are the questions you might want to ask, right? These, this is the information to uh, get yourself ready for a PT exam or whatever it may be. But we want to support you from there all the way until past, your, past the time that you leave this earth. We want to protect and be there for your family also. So that's what we mean, cradle to grave, to be there for you. We're going to also want to be there for you, and we're going to be there for you through these resource books we have back here. These are like goals. Like I told you, I was out of the military for 20 years before I even submitted a claim. 17 years before I went to a county veteran service office. My friend said, I didn't even know about a county veteran service office, tell you the truth. My friend said, you need to go to the county veteran service office, Jen. Say, you have benefits, you have benefits, you have benefits. And I said, I only served four years. 
I'm not broken. I'm good. I'm, I, I, you know, Same. he's like, but you have benefits, Jen. So I went over to the County Veterans Service Office and I was like, hey, what are my benefits, right? And they were like, well, what do you want? I had no idea what to ask for. And they handed me this book. And I was like, are you serious? I had no idea this existed. So get one of those books, download one of those books and share those books with everybody because they are like gold. They really are. Here is our website. It's super user-friendly. Do not be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of rabbit holes because the rabbit holes lead to carrots. Carrots lead to your benefits. Benefits is money in your pocket, all right? I'm not joking. Um, I learned quite a bit through this website, but I've circled some things that I would want you to know and like their highlights. If, if you don't go anywhere else on this website, this is where you're gonna go. So I first have your circled in the middle there is find local CVSO. So if you move somewhere, Right now you have Ed's information, you have Maurice's information, but maybe you might move to Southern California. Maybe you might move to Northern California, up higher in Northern California. You can click on find local CVSO and it'll have every single county in the count, uh, in the state of California. You click on that and it'll open up all the different offices, the times that are open, all that great information is gonna be there. The next you have the Veterans Resource Book, you can download it here at any time. So share it with everybody and anybody, honestly. And the last thing is the CalTAP portal. You click on that, you'll go to all the different mod pathways within CalTAP. So we have a pathway for education. We have a path, so your education benefits in that pathway. We have a, a pathway for um, employment. So it's gonna help you get those jobs, right? We're gonna give you some tips and tricks and benefits and support to find your jobs. We have a pathway on entrepreneurship. Maybe you wanna open your own business. We have information on that, on our, that lives on our website for you. Lots of great stuff in that portal. I went through a lot of information pretty quick and I didn't go through all the benefits of California, but we're here all the time. I have my phone number here. Please give me a call or email me if you wanna ask me any questions at all. What I didn't do when we started was I did not introduce Kevin Graves. Kevin Graves is our county vet, oh, whoa, is our local interagency network coordinator, our link in the Bay Area. He's gonna link you to all the great things that are in here in the Bay Area, right? So. He can tell you all about what he does. Yes, it's your turn. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for that. <clears throat> you guys have gotten a ton of information. Most of it is in my presentation, so I'm just going to do a recap. Um, but <clears throat> it's important to know uh, that there are people that are available statewide to benefit you. This is our regional map. We, there's eight of us covering... 1.3 million veterans in the state of California, so we're not busy. And um, uh, my region, obviously, is the light green region there here at the Bay Area. I've got 10 counties. Some of us have geographical challenges. Some of us have uh, uh, population challenges. But we try to, to cover the state the best we can. And as uh, as Jen said, we're available throughout the state. So, the, so if you're in a different part of the state or if you have a brother, sister, friend, colleagues, somebody you served with that's someplace else in the state, refer them to the local link that's in their area because I know the benefits and resources of, of the Bay Area pretty well. I have no idea what happens in San Diego and Imperial County. I have a link down there that knows those. So that's how this map can be important. Please reach out to us. Um, we provide outreach to you. We make referrals uh, at, to service provider networks. Uh, we assist with local emergencies, fires, uh, natural disasters, uh, and civil unrest. We uh, will go to those locations. We'll make sure the veterans have what they need. A great example of that was the fires up in Santa Rosa about five years ago when that fire moved through, through there so fast. Veterans were leaving their home without their hearing aids, without their meds. With that. We were there at the local assistance center connecting them with immediate replacement medication, which is very important, and hearing aids and those other things. So we're there to assist in that. And then we also advocate on your behalf uh, locally uh, we want to make sure that the local leaders of the communities understand the value of having you veterans living within their community with your leadership skills and your and your ability to give back to the community. You guys have been in service your whole life, and I know you still want to do that. We connect you to benefits, and this is kind of a, an overview again, uh, but for employment, we rely heavily on our sister agency, the EDD. They have dedicated DevOps and levers. They have dedicated individuals that are funded strictly for working with veterans. To help you to help provide you with job resources to get jobs resumes and also they have people that are dedicated to find employers that want to hire veterans so that's who we use for that uh 
this was covered very thoroughly, our county veteran service officers, but I want to tell you, I can't reiterate enough how important they are. And I think somebody made the point, we have 58 counties in the state of California. The state can't be everywhere. So it was legislated years ago that we would, with subvention money, help fund their offices and make sure that they were, for all the benefits that are provided through CalVet, they certify the eligibility. We don't, they do. But they also advocate on your behalf. A lot of times we will handle the appeals because we work together as a team. But again, 58 counties, 56 of them have county veteran service offices because a couple of them don't register any population at all, hardly. Um, and then uh, for your healthcare and, uh, and mental health, obviously we work with our big brother, the VA, would help you to navigate that pr process if we can. Uh, and, um, uh, that's it. So that was just kind of an overview. I want to get through it quick. We're running out of time. That's me. That's my cell phone. For those of you that are online, that's my cell phone. Please uh, write it down, take a picture of it, screenshot or something. Uh, if you need anything, if you can't find, if you hit a brick wall, call me. And I'm sure that through the networks that I know, I will be able to navigate that and help get to the right place. I probably won't have the answer. These people are the experts, our CVSOs, and they talk about all those laws. They change all the time. So they're constantly going through training, some of them provided by the state, that helps them make sure that they're giving you the best possible service you can get and identifying any issues as they change. And we're hearing about the big changes, the PAC Act, but small ones change constantly, and they keep up with that. So rely heavily on your CVSOs. That's all I got for you. Have a great day. What do I do now? Uh, pass it over to you, Kevin. Yeah. And, and uh, Blair is here also back there. Blair is our uh, honorary uh, mascot for Calvet, right? <laughs> um, so we're going to go into Q&A now. And what we're going to do is we're going to hand the floor over to Sean. Sean is another CalTAP training coordinator. And he's been on the back end uh, looking at all the uh, questions and such there. We're going to start off with everybody for in the virtual side with their questions. Um, and then we'll go to Skyline with their questions. And then we'll do questions here. Um, if we don't have enough time, it won't be recorded, but the uh, CBS knows are gonna stand a little bit longer if you guys have further questions. Are you ready, Sean? Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much, Jennifer and Kevin. And thank you everyone for attending today. Um, right now, looking at the Q&A, there isn't any questions that's been submitted. Um, so if people do have questions, please feel free to drop them into the, the questions and answer panel. The chat we've been using to put in some different information, we put in the CalVet resource book in there and uh, the link map as well. And I'll, I'm happy to drop a, a PDF copy of our presentation into the chat for people to download as well. But at this time, there's no questions from the so, online virtual crowd. So does Skyline have a... A computer app, is Skyline able to? Are we able to, Bridget or Lauren, are we able to? Hey there, no, there's no um, genetic, like general questions from my students here. They have the contact information for follow-up more in depth um, oh. questions, but I do see on my end, um, Sean, I see a question from Lindsay in the Q&A box. You want me to just read that off? Uh, if you, you could, that? that'd be great. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Not populating on my end. Uh, oh no, no, that's okay because I can read the the online one. So I have um. So Lindsay is saying I'm assisting a veteran who is rated at ninety percent and would like to file for unemployment or unemployment ability. Would they need to go through the claims process again, or what's the first step? Did you guys hear that, CBSO? Yeah. So filing for unemployment ability is different different from the time that claims process to it. Yes, uh, they can do it. I mean, again, they can do it individually, or they can reach out to the assault and get their assistance to do it, which I would highly suggest because that's not there's some nuances to that program, it's not quite as easy as people might think. And, and unfortunately, if someone does it, gets rejected, might be they might be completely rejected when in fact they were always entitled to just didn't maybe cover all the bases. So I would reach out to the DSO and work with them directly. And I'll just add to that, um, I didn't hear the entire question, but just like any claim. A claim for IU, individual unemployability, requires evidence. And we can help you understand what evidence you might need for your specific condition or issue or what your, you know, why, why you feel like you should or need individual unemployability. 
to direct to that uh, to that evidence. All right. So what we're going to do is since Can I ask a follow up question on yeah. that came up a couple of days ago, Stephen Head here in the center. Definitely one that I think would be best answered for this yesterday. I think there's some good people got on it, but CBSO. So say I'm at 80 percent. I get IU, right? And I'm going to go on the portability. How does that, well, how does that impact or not impact my ability to be on Chapter 31, which is an employment program, we are a need, since you're un you know, at 100% via unemployability. So how did, did one cancel out essentially your VRE? Will one cancel out the other? Yeah, it should be. Yeah, cancel out the VRE, but once you start working, that's when you know, are you aware what you well not necessarily but how much money right? So yeah, yeah um it's it, that's a that's a tricky question because I think you know I personally haven't seen the regulations specifically stating you cannot be on you cannot be on VR and D um and be on individual unemployability. VR and D is a program to help you become employable despite your disabilities. Individual unemployability, of course, boosts your income because your disabilities prevent you from being employed. Right. So just by the nature of things, they're kind of counterintuitive, right, or contradictory. Yeah. But I know veterans who are on individual unemployability and BRD simultaneously. I personally have never seen the regulation that states one is not, uh, one contradicts the other, so therefore you're not eligible. So, you know, I've been not looked. Yeah, yeah I did not look. I was like, that's a good question. Yeah. So, you know, as, as CVSO, as, as veteran service rep, we, don't always know the answers, but we also know where to get those answers. In yeah, this case, did. I don't know where to get that answer. That's <laughs> great. Yeah, we'll that. The other thing that I do find actually doing a lot of, which I think is a benefit, is we'll give you the program box and you post one. Yeah. Because some people say, hey, I don't want to ever lose my my informal yeah. ability. Yeah. But I want to work. Okay, well, let's have a conversation. We'll have this like. So ultimately, they'll be to make a choice, but I, I, I've never also seen the same thing. I've never seen anyone going to be our name group or anything. Okay. But Keep in mind, uh, the threshold is, is, is the FTL, so that's not a lot, but it's a thousand. Yeah. So the minute you start getting working above that in the tax database, the wage database starts you know, sending that information to the, to the uh, VA, and then how, how that is, they'll potentially set up for a re-examination of the work entries. It's true that that's going to be And you can, you can apply for it if you want to go to multiple times. Yeah, right. You can go to different phases in the market. Okay. Yeah. That's all great. I didn't know what it is. So that was a really great question. Um, so I just want to point out, because I haven't pointed this out yet quite, huh, Sean? Uh, we have our survey link right here. Uh, the survey link, it's not, I don't get raises, I don't get tips from the survey, I don't get kudos, you know, it's nothing. It is actually so that we can make these presentations better for you. We don't want to come out here and waste your time at all. We want to give you really great information. So if you do these surveys, we actually look at them, we make changes. We do, if I'm doing something great, we're doing something great, say we're doing something great. If we're lacking somewhere, let us know. If there's something else we can do and present on, you have suggestions for us, let us know through uh, this QR code right here. Um, and then on, and then this QR code with CalVet in it, it's the actual PowerPoint that you guys are seeing right now because there was quite a bit of information. So I want to bring that to your attention also. We can uh, keep on doing questions, but make sure the questions that you're asking are very general. We don't want any um, HIPAA violations or anything like that. Um, if you want to do more private questions or questions about a claim, make an appointment with the CVSO, sit down with them and actually like go through those specifics. And I'm happy, I don't know, Ed, you're gonna stick around. I'm happy to stick around for the veterans here at CCSF to answer some questions. Okay. Yeah. All right, Sean, do we have any more come in? Oh, it looks like I'm a lot there. Uh, I did not see any more on my end, but it looks like I'm having some connectivity issues with the questions and answers. Um, I don't know if anyone else has seen any other online questions, but I did not see any other ones. Um, do you think, can you help me on that side? Yeah. Okay. I was also going to mention too that if anybody does also want to sign up for VA healthcare and get an ID card, I've got a sign up page for the CBSO and a Google link to that one. And then for the San Francisco you guys are welcome to do that. I think I might just sit here and just uh, read through the questions. I can get any more questions. Okay. Actually, just the, I did take a photo of a couple of links just in case that's helpful. Yeah. Um, I think the first one was. 
I'm assisting a veteran who's rated at 90% and would like to file for unemployed. That one's already, so that one's already yeah. been answered. The other one was, can you provide a copy of the PowerPoint? <laughs> okay. um, the next one was, um, it's a little bit specific, but it was someone who um, said, I know I can start submitting my disability claims for compensation purposes 180 days from retirement. Yeah. Um, and, anything. and the question was, how do I know what I'm supposed to claim? Okay. And then the second one was, is there a checklist guidance on what everything I'm supposed to claim to ensure I'm in claim, claiming everything I'm supposed to? So those are really, really great questions. And the BDD, what you're going to do is you're going to co contact the County Veterans Service Office as soon as possible. Bring, uh, request your medical records from the base and take that, make an appointment and take that to the County Veterans Service Office. And then you guys go through page by page, right? Yeah. I mean, the BDD claim benefits delivery at discharge is if you are within 90 to 180 days, 180 days, 90 days of separation. So you have to be in that time frame. And now they require you to have a do a disability fill out part of a disability benefits questionnaire called the SHA. I'm blanking on what that stands for off the top of my head, but you have to submit that with your DD 214 and your service treatment records. So to answer the part about um, you know what do you claim? Well, what injuries or illnesses or events that occurred in your service did you um, did, did you suffer? Did you get treated for? If you didn't get treatment, you're still within that 180 days to 90 days, get treatment for those conditions. That's the key, treatment. Evidence that points to the this injury or illness or event happening having happened in the service. Yeah, absolutely. This person, have they already gotten out of service? You might want to they, they haven't gotten out yet. So. Oh, if you claim don't. everything. <laughs> yeah. Claim everything. everything. Oh, claim everything. Yeah, just, I, I, yeah, I say bring your, uh, your service record in, and then usually what happens is the county that service office will page by page. There'll be a page that says current diagnoses, and then another one that says hasn't things that have happened that you haven't said anything about. They're gonna look at that and be like, hey, are you still having this issue? If so, make sure you tell them it's ongoing. If they forget the exam while they're still in service, it's automatically service connected. Absolutely. So Absolutely. and and I, I've been doing this, I've been helping veterans. Because it's supposed to be done within, within uh, 90, 180 days. Mm -hmm. Very, very rarely done. Uh, in terms of afterwards. One year. Oh, one year. No, no. In terms of when they're supposed to get the benefit. They're, 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 they commit to, uh, it's supposed to be within a few weeks. Yeah. Uh, exactly. And it's, it's, it's way delayed because of uh, how backlog the VA is right now. So I've been working with a lot of veterans on this. I see veterans filing claims for 20 plus items. Okay. And it is working in their favor. Yes. Oh, absolutely. I hate to say it because it's a lot of VA now. <laughs> We have one other question too, unless you wanted to add anything. You're good. <laughs> that sounds good. And and folks can also reach out to you guys with additional questions or from your local county veteran service office. The last question that I saw, and I can double check, is that um, it's a little bit of a specific question, but I'll try to make it a little bit more generalizable. So it's someone who's trying to increase their claims from like 80 to 100. They were sent to like an independent, not a VA facility, but an independent facility. Um, in California for appointments, which I think is fairly common. And they've been waiting for their payment for mileage for about three months. And I have heard that come up before. So I was just kind of, okay, the gotcha. question is kind of- First, I thought you were talking about they're paying to get an independent examination, cool. medical opinion. Okay, good. We're not talking about that because I highly recommend not doing that. It's not, the VA is actually cracking down on that. Um, but to get your mileage reimbursement, you have to go through the compensation. It's the compensation and pension, the third-party vendor that is contracting that compensation and pension examination is the entity that is paying you, reimbursing you. So you should, it's usually by check. So uh, check your mail, if your address has changed, make sure you check with that vendor, that third party vendor, QTC, BES, uh, LHI, Optum Serve, and now uh, Loyal's something, I forget the name. But there's four different vendors, at least here in, the, in California, that specifically provide these contracted exams that the VA request, they do the payment. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, don't, yeah. 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 Don't miss your CMP exams. Don't miss your CMP exams. <laughs> does, yeah. any, yeah. does anybody here have general questions that are here? Yeah. No? Yeah. All right, I think that we will wrap up this presentation at that oh. event. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for being here. And I want you, I want every, just, I want to close out with this. And I always close out with this because I've, 
Because you guys are mean. Because you guys are mean, that's why. But I want to say thank you. Thank you for your service. And congratulations on your decision to go for your degrees. You've earned these benefits, and I'm really happy that you're using your benefits. And I want you to go home and hug your parents, hug your kids, hug your spouses, hug your friends, whoever helped you to get through that time of your life while you're serving, and they're currently helping you to get through this next transition. Give them a hug, because uniformed or not, we all serve. Mother, fathers, grandparents, kids. We deployed with you. So give them a hug and tell them thank you. Too. So thank you so much for your service. Thank you for being here today. There's a lot of you guys here today. So, um, and thank you for being advocates because you're getting this information and I know you're gonna forward this information to other people. So thank you for that too. Thank you to our insane, we have great presenters today. Um, Ed and Maurice, oh my God, wow. And then Lauren and Bridget, thank you so much. Um, and then Kevin, of course, he is our boost on the ground. Fantastic. Um, so we'll close up the, the uh, workshop at, uh, at this point. And then we are gonna open up for the people that are here. You can uh, sign up for VA Healthcare and talk to the CVSOs and get connected to your benefits. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, thank you, Brian. I'm here every day. Thank you, Brian. And also, I was going to mention to you that if there are any folks online that still had questions that were to be answered, yeah. Hey, uh, John, that they should be answered. Yes, ma'am. If you uh, let everybody know who's online, is it, uh, if they have any of the questions, they can email them so, to Caltap. Absolutely. For those of you who have further questions, please feel free to email us at Caltap, and I'll put our email address into the uh, into the chat. And thank you again to everyone for joining us today. I mean, okay.